Faithful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. They do it sometimes. Uh, you know, let me give you an example. Spiritually, if, if you want to be successful spiritually, you want to do something consistently. You don't want to pray sometimes. You want to get in a devotion uh, for a hot week and you're all excited about it. Or you get into a devotion for a month and you're like, yes, but someone that's successful, they consistently do that. That's just something they do day in and day out. It's part of a system they live by. Financially, you don't want to, oh, my God, I'm saving for a particular thing. Well, why don't you just save continually, you know, consistently, and that'll make you be successful in your finances. Physically, you know, um, I, I know we can all challenge ourselves physically to be consistent. And, you know, that's something that uh, I have to do. Every year I work out about five and a half, seven months out of the year. For sure, I'm going to work out about seven months out of the year. I'm like, man, why I just can't work out every day? <laughs> like, you know, and it's just, it's just successful people because you'll go to the gym and it's people in there successful and you look at me like, wow. They do consistently what I do occasionally, and, and so they're successful. What about relationally, working on relationships, working uh, with connecting with people and, and talking to people? It's not a sometime thing. I feel like talking, around, talking to people today. I feel like being around people today because sometimes you have those type of people, right? You know, they feel like, it. You know, oh, I don't feel like being around a one today. Well, if you don't learn how to work on your relationships, you will get... Uh, you do that occasionally, and you won't be successful in your relationships. So get that. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. What I want to talk about is goals to hit your target today. I want to talk about goals to hit your target because we all have something we're aiming at. We have a target. We have goals. We have, uh, you know, what defines success? That's what a target is. A target defines what success is. A target defines whether you're succeeding or not, wh whether you hit your aim, you hit your target, you hit what you wanted to do. You know, you set a, a target out and you shoot at it. Now, you know if you missed it because there's uh, uh, you know, there's, it shows you, you know, there's a gauge. It has a bullseye, then it has circle and different colors, and you're trying to hit the bullseye. And we, you know when you missed it. And so in life, I think that's what we need to do. We, have, we need to have targets, something that we're, we're aiming at. Well, we know whether it's success or not. We don't need to be shooting, you know, shooting, just shooting up a barn and then painting targets around the hole that we already shot. And saying, yes, I hit it, bullseye. No, well, you got to be able to have a target. And so uh, our habits will make us or break us. We become what we do repetitively. What we repeatedly do, that's what we become. What we do consistently, we do that repetitively. We repeat it over and over again. Our habits will make us or break us. And what we become is totally connected what we repeat. We become what we repeatedly do. And so we have uh, perfect timing, you know, um, because many times, you know, <laughs> around the year we start resolutions, like I said. So, you know, many of you making them up right now, right, or you made them already. This is my resolution. Let me go ahead and tell you 92% won't last at all. 92% of the people, no, seriously, this is, this is a fact. Okay, typically in the gym, like around this time, I, I noticed yesterday I was watching a football game, and they kept on putting treadmill, and, you know, and, and, and bicycle commercials on. I'm like, they are killing it. They know exactly what they're doing. It's the season where everybody wants to get in shape. And then right, you know, because I've been in the gym around January, but usually around the end of January or February, it, you know, I can get my treadmill that I usually have all the time. You know, because, you know, I, I can't get it. If, you know, January, I can't get it. I can't get it. You know, people are like, you know, I'm like, gosh, man, here we go again. And then around February, it's like, okay, everybody's out the way now. Now I can get my treadmill. But 92% of the resolutions won't last. Let, let me give you a principle today. In the book of Romans, Romans chapter 7, verse 15 says, I don't really understand myself. Anybody ever felt like that? I really don't understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Anybody ever done that before? <laughs> you want to do what's right. It's like, man, I got to do this, man. I want to do it, and then all of a sudden you just find yourself not 
doing it. I want to go to the gym. I want to save money. You know, I want to get this right. Right? I, I want to hit the target. As you jump over to verse 18 and 19, it says, I want to do what is right, but I can't. Have anybody ever felt like, I just can't. It seemed like I just can't do it. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I do, don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. It's like, man, I'm, I'm challenging myself to do the right thing, but it seems like I just don't do it. And then it continues in verse 24. Look, it says, oh, what a miserable person I am. They come to the conclusion, man, I am messed up. Oh, what a miserable person. Why? Because what I want to do, I don't do. I want to do what's right, but I can't do it. And so it's a war going on inside. There's a battle. I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm doing it anyway. It says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Why wouldn't you be miserable? You should be miserable, right? Inside, when you're torn, you're going to be miserable. That's the most miserable person, the person that knows the right thing and don't want to do it. It's not the person that's not saved. It's the person that knows the right thing to do and just won't do it. And so this concludes in verse 24. He says, what a miserable person I am. I'm out of there. I'm torn. I'm confused. I'm missing the target. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank God, right? Now, look at this. This is not talking about salvation here. It's not talking about a person that's saying, oh, my God, I'm not saved. You know what? I I, I need to be saved. So thanks be to God that he's going to save me. No, no, no. This is talking to the person that is saved, that knows the Lord because he knows the right thing to do. She knows the right thing to do, but yet she just will not do it. Where does the right thing come from? Where does the right thing come from? From the Lord, the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So, So it's obvious that we have challenges when it comes to doing the resolutions or doing the plans or hitting the targets that we have. Some of us may say, like, in our prayer life, we may say, well, I just don't have time to pray. Well, Jesus was a pretty busy guy, I'd say. He came and saved the world, but still he would escape away from the crowds of people, and he would go find time to go before Jesus, before God and speak to him. Jesus would talk to God. He would escape. Well, many of us may say, well, I don't have time to witness and testify. I go to work. I got my kids. You know, um, I have bills. But guess what? Paul had a habit of going around unsaved people. Paul would go to the synagogues, go to the temple and share with non-believers. He still found a way, and he had a lot of responsibility. He actually wrote the Bible, uh, about 60% of the, uh, of the New Testament. Uh, he was planting churches, and, oh, yeah, he had disciples that he was training, and he was writing a lot of letters, you know, to people. And so he'd done a lot. He would go to jail, but he still found a way to make it happen. He found a way to testify to unbelievers. Some of us may say, well, I can't stop eating junk food. You know, I can't stop overspending. I I can't stop going to Target. When I pass by Target, it just calls my name. You know, but I, I... I got a question. Why do we generally fail when we come, um, when it comes to resolutions or hitting our targets or having these goals? Why do we typically fail? Why does 92% of resolutions get thrown in the trash can come February? Well, I got three reasons we don't succeed. I got three reasons why. One, we focus on the what, but we don't understand the how. We'll say what we want to do, but we won't necessarily say how we're going to do it. This is what I'm going to do, but we never have a strategic plan of how it's going to work out. I want to lose weight. What are you going to do then? What is the system? You know, I, I, you know what I want to do? You know, whatever it may be. I want to save money. What is your system then? What is it that you're going to do? Goals don't determine success. Systems determine success. See, a lot of times we just say what we're going to do, but we don't say how we're going to do it. Because you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. 
If there's not a system in place, it won't work. We think we need to change the results. I need to change the way I look. I, just, I need to change, you know, I need to lose weight. I need to be more organized. I need to pay off some credit card debt. I need to change the systems that cause those results. That's what I need to do. I need to change the systems. I mean, I need to change, you know, the patterns. You know, I need to change this. You know, we think about it because we want success or we want to change it, but many times we don't focus on the how. We just focus on the what. I want to change my life. I want to be off drugs. I want to be off alcohol. Well, how? How? Because we can't fall into a system of like, Jesus is going to do it. No, I think he left that one on you, buddy. Jesus is going to do it. Well, you can pray and, and, and you know, God, that's why God goes through a process of renewing our minds so we can make better decisions. Because actually he says, you're going to be the underlord, I'm going to be the overlord. That's why he sent Adam on earth because the goal was for Adam to replenish the earth, and he was going to be in heaven. He was going to talk to him from heaven. Heaven was going to talk to earth, and earth was going to be established like heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because there's going to be a relationship with God, and God is going to speak to you, and he's not going to just do it for you. He's really expecting you to actually do something through a relationship with him. And, and so many times that's what happened. We want to just fix what we do, and we think outcomes fix itself. And we're going to touch that a little bit more. But I want to talk about why we don't succeed many times. Well, one, because we focus on the what instead of focusing on the how to. We don't see progress fast enough, right? We go, we go to the treadmill. We get on the treadmill three times, and we gain th two pounds. You're like, what happened? Like, what I just don't understand. How, how did this happen? How did I go to, to the gym three times this week, and I still gain weight? You know, you know, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to read the Bible three times this week or five times this week, and you still yell at your kids. You're like, what happened? I thought that reading the Bible was going to change. I'm going to go to church, right? I'm not going to buy coffee all month, right? It seemed, you know, I'm going to save $100 on not buying coffee this month, and then you look at your account, and you're still uh, down $500. It's like, what happened? What happened? You know why? Because we wrongly conclude something. We wrongly conclude that small, good decisions don't matter that much. We think small, good decisions don't matter that much. That's why we just overlook the small decision. We're looking for this big, humongous decision we need to make to transform my life, but we wrongly conclude that small, good decisions don't matter that much. You know, I'm going to play video games for three hours. And, you know, my wife's not going to leave me. Well, eventually it's going to create a pattern, right? You know, it's going to be, I'm going to skip church one weekend. It doesn't seem like it matter, right? Just, it's just one, one, you know, I'm going to just eat a half box of chocolate, and we think it just don't matter. You know, it can't, nobody can really tell, right, can they? <laughs> but small bad decisions, we think they rarely wreck our lives at once. And they don't, but they end, tend to add up. Because we begin to start having a habit of making these small, bad decisions. And they're just small, but we don't, we don't see that it's fine. It's kindly just tweaking us away from hitting that target that we said we wanted to hit. Like if the target's right here, we're making small, bad decisions. We don't realize that it's just getting us off track and we're never hitting the destiny that God wanted us to hit. You know what? You know what gets it? That hard work, that discipline, those sacrifices, that faithfulness is not being wasted. It's stored up. Those small decisions that you think that really don't matter, they do. Those small decisions of, no, I'm not going to take a drink tonight. No, I'm not going to have sex right now with you. No, I'm not going to. Those small decisions add up. And we don't understand that those small decisions really do add up. So we, you know, we miss it. We wrongly conclude that. Small good decisions don't matter that much. They don't matter. You overcome self-doubt and failure through starting again, just getting up. That's a small decision, but it matters. 
If you keep on getting in a wreck and you just go sit and eat chocolate and sit over and cry and look at pictures, and I mean, you're setting yourself up that you're creating a pattern to continuously be depressed. You don't understand that those small decisions matter. But when you fall, you get right back up. You know, self-doubt, depression, fear, all those things come from us making those small decisions of feeding into that mess. We got to have a grind. We got to have persistence. You know, you know we got to pay the private price sometime. I paid a whole bunch of private prices. No one knew that I was paying the price. If I was paying the price, no one understood. It was the small consistencies, those small disciplines that matter. Many people, we wrongly conclude that small, good decisions don't matter that much. And I'm going to tell you another thing we conclude, wrongly conclude, that small, bad decisions don't matter that much. We think those small, bad decisions don't matter that much. And they're adding up. Our life is the sum total of all the small decisions that we make. They begin to start adding up, those small decisions. That's what happens many times. We miss it, and we don't see that the small decisions. And so because we don't get results fast we want, we begin to start making real bad small decisions because we don't see the results. Oh, I'm not going to the gym today. You don't see the deposit. Ah, I'm not going to church today. And you think it's a, you come up with a great reason why. I get it all the time. People tell me, this happened, this. I'm like, oh, okay. That's on you. But I'm going to tell you, every small decision, not just church, it's in everything. I'm going to just take this $7 and I'm going to go get three bags of Doritos once a week. Add it up. That is up. Do it for the rest of your life. Do it just gradually. Just go get you an ocean spray and always just swipe in your card. And eventually you're wondering why you're not financially fit now. <coughs> it's the time that no one sees that brings results everybody wants. It's no one sees those private practices. Those private disciplines of, of consistently getting up early in the morning and, and devoting an hour or so of praying. Those times of just getting up, you know what I'm saying, when nobody's around and nobody hears you, you crying to God. No one hears you opening up those pages and turning those pages and trying to seek God's heart. It's those small things. It's the things that no one sees that brings the results everybody wants. Everybody will sit over and be looking at you. And they'll be wondering, well, why are you successful? Why are you going forward? It's like most of us, we get the wrong idea. We think that we get results fast. So we don't see progress fast enough. And so what we do is we throw off whatever resolution, whatever goal we had, whatever thing that we said we want to do. Uh, another reason why we fail and we don't succeed when we set goals is our distorted identity sabotages our success. Our distorted identity sabotages our success. Moses told God, I'm not a good speaker. I don't know how to speak. I can't speak well. And God said, hush, just go. <laughs> Gideon said, I'm weak. I'm the weakest of everyone. He says, man, just sit here and watch what I can do through you. Do You don't understand who your identity is in me. Paul said, I'm the least, in the unworth, the least of all apostles. I'm the chief sinner. God says, if you surrender to me. See, many times what we do is we focus on commitment instead of focusing on surrender. Yeah. Commitment, you're still in charge. Surrender, God's in charge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. See, surrender means you ain't in charge no more. Commitment means you determine when you come, when you don't come, how you do it. See, I don't want to be committed to God's will. I want to be surrendered to God's will. I, I don't want to be committed to church. I want to be surrendered to church. I don't want to be committed to God's plan. I want to be surrendered to God's plan. Why? Because then I'm putting the ball in God's court and his power flowing through me versus me and my commitment. That's still a little uh, picture of pride and arrogance. Let me give you this. An unhealthy identity creates unwise decisions or habits. An unhealthy identity creates, creates unwise habits. That's what happens with us when we have an un, 
healthy identity, meaning we have a weird, perverted view of who we are. We don't really know who we are. And so I'm going to get to the crux of what I want to talk about. This is what I want to get to you. See, I encourage you to take a different approach this year. Most people create do goals. They create goals to do. And so remember, an unhealthy identity creates unwise habits. And get this, unwise habits reinforces an unhealthy identity. So it continues to, to perpetuate. You know, it continues to evolve. Because I have an unhealthy identity, I don't know who I am, I have unwise habits, and because I have unwise habits, it continues to reinforce an unhealthy identity that I have. And so now I'm going through this, you know, this circle, this vicious circle of sabotaging myself because I really don't know who I am, but I'm setting up these goals of what I need to do. Doesn't that sound so weird? I don't need to do this. I need to have this resolution. I got all these do goals. I need to read more, get more sleep. I need less time on social media. Enemy tells you what you're not. That's who he tells you. He tells you what you're not. He doesn't tell you anything about what you do. He tells you what you're not. You're a failure. You're not a child of God. What is he attacking? Your identity. Because the identity is what's important for us to know. It's not about what we do. It's about our identity. See, a lot of us, we, we're missing it. We come and we'll, we'll come and we'll say something about what we're going to do this year. So I encourage you to start not with do goals, with who goes. Who do you want to become? <clears throat> who do you want to be? See, because once you get who you want to be down, the do will follow. See, most of the time we're focusing on what we, it's reverse. We're focused on what we need to do instead of focusing on who we supposed to be. See, if we focus on who we supposed to be, then we'll do different things. Because out of your identity comes your actions. Some of us say, well, I stink handling money. We'll begin to get your integrity up. That's who you are. And when you get your integrity up, you'll handle money better. I want to be a true man of God. I want to be a godly wife. I want to be a godly mom, a bold witness. These are the things you want to be. I want to be a witness. I want to be sober. I want to be clean. I want to be financially free. I want to be a healthy person. I want to be not what I want to do. It's who I want to be. This is just who I am. When someone says, why do you do that? That's just who I am. Man, I want to be able, I don't know how many times I've been discipling people say, man, I just want to be able to do what you do, man. I just want to be able to handle pressure and seem like all oh, hell be breaking loose in your life, pastor, and you just keep on flowing. I want to be able to do that. I'm like, well, you're going to have to learn to get your identity from God, the same God that I have. Because he, he's the one getting our identity. It's not about what I do. It's about you know, who I am. And that takes time. Some of us are trapped in the same identity we've been in for years. But we keep on setting these resolutions day in and day out of who we want, what we want to do. But I'm here to tell you, set the goals of who you want to be. And let's see God do something special. Amen. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 and 7 says, We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ. So that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Someone say, I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no, longer a slave to sin. no, come on, you got to believe that. I'm no longer a slave to sin. Come on, get that in your spirit. I'm no longer a slave to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Verse 18 continues. It says, now you are free from your slavery to sin. And you have become slaves to righteous living. Who am I? That's the question you should be asking. Who am I? Not what you need to be doing. Who am I? Who am I as a person of God? 
Who am, am I? You know, because you're forgiven. You're a child of God. You're redeemed. You've been washed in the blood. You're an overcomer. You're a mighty person. You're the head, not the tail. The Bible tells us who we are. And identity shapes your actions. Identity always shapes your actions. You will do a particular thing because of your identity, who you are. It's not in reverse. Don't ever think it's in reverse that you're going to set some things up and I'm going to do this. And you, you, It's not about what you do. It's about who. So this year, it's not about setting a lot of resolutions and all these goals. You know what the target is? Find out who I am. Find out who I am in Christ. And I'm going to tell you, this is a long, 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 long journey. Some of us, we conclude that I already know. Well, this is a, a constantly evolving thing. That's if you're growing. Some people say, well, I know pastor. Well, you better get close to me because I'm still trying to change. You better get around me because you ain't going to get to know me unless you get around me. You know what I'm saying? Because I want to be evolving. And for me, if I'm away from somebody for about a year, I'm like, man, we got to invest some time in getting to know one another again. Why? Because I hope you've been changing because I know I have. And because I don't know you no more, you don't know me. We know of each other, but we've all changed over time. And so that's the importance of having the target of getting to know who you are. Remember, healthy identity creates positive habits. And positive habits, they reinforce a healthy identity. Why do you have this healthy identity? Because you have these positive habits. Why do you have these positive habits? Because you are healthy in your identity. Who do you want to become? That's the question. Not what do you want to do next year. Who do you want to become? It's more about who, not what. Oh, so many people could sit down and tell me, what are your goals this year? I said, man, it's to get to know Jesus more. And I know that's a textbook thing, but I really want to like be walking and just hear him be like, nah, I'm not going that direction. Some people claim that stuff, but some people claim it. Some people claim it. No, seriously, but I want to hear him like just, ooh, man, I want to hear his voice so clear. You know, I want to be able to, to know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing in life. I want to get clarity from him. I want to just sit down and bask in his presence and enjoy it and don't let nothing come in between me and God. Not, a, not an attitude, not a person. No one robbed me. Or I don't allow nobody to come in my space that would intrude that. No sin, no nothing, nothing. Now, I'm not saying perfect, but I want to get to a point where I know him better. That's what my goal is, and that's who he created me to be. And that's a God who loves Jesus is obsessed with his bride. He's a great dad. He's a better father. He's a better husband. A woman that's obsessed with Jesus, she's a better wife. She's a better, uh, she's a better mother. She's a, a mighty woman of God. She's devoted to uh, serving the Lord and reaching other people. She's devoted to, you know, somehow getting plugged into a church and serving. Because some weird reason we didn't came to a point where we think we just come to church, but we don't supposed to have. The Bible says when we have a gift, we're supposed to release that gift in, our, in, the, in, the, in the body. You know, that, that's the whole goal. Is you, if you got a gift, release it in the body. That's the whole goal. You got to read in, in 1 Corinthians. It talks about it all day. If you got a gift, a prophecy, you got a gift, you release that thing. You, you, don't, you, know, you, you, know, you don't selfishly just hold, sit on that thing. It's supposed to bless the body. Who do you want to become? A strong leader who becomes, believes in people and is helping them to be more of a world changer. Who do you want to be? A guy that takes care of or whatever God has entrusted me in, whatever, whatever properties, whatever houses, whatever cars, whatever people. You know, who do you want to be? And, and I always read this. This is something I read to myself constantly. Well, you know, I, it's been something that I do all the time, pretty much every morning. I am a man of God, speaking it in my life, a father to the fatherless, a developer of fathers. I am convinced the gospel of Jesus Christ is our only hope. I am passionate about seeing transformation in my life along with others. I am dedicated to church planning today. Like every day, I will serve Jesus with all my heart to play my role in the kingdom of 
God. That's what I'm telling myself every day. I am a man of God. I am a father of the father. I've made it my screensaver. I look at it constantly. Three or four times I die, I look at it and say, God, I am a man of God. Because you know what the enemy is trying to tell me? I'm not. You know what the enemy is trying to tell you, whether you want to agree with it or not? That's why you, many of us get in depression, because we're, we're, we forgot our identity. We forgot who we are. We forgot we're overcomers. We forgot that he is greater in us than he that is in the world. Greater is he that exists in us than he that is in the world. We forget that I can do all things through Christ. With strength. We forget that I can get a word from God. I don't have to have a word for my depression and my emotions and my feelings. We forget who we are. And because of us forgetting who we are, we can set every goal in under the sun. And if we don't know who we are, there's no way we'll do those goals. Because what takes birth out of identity is action. Action shapes your, act, your identity, and identity shapes your actions. It's very important for us to know that. And so today I ask each and every last one of you, what does 2020 look like for you? Is it something before you that's going to challenge you to become better of a person? Are you going to come to a po- the conclusion and realize, I don't need to set goals. I need to become a particular person. And the goals would just, I mean, you'll just totally, like flat weed goals. You will blow through goals. You'll be accomplishing goals and won't even know it. I'm more growth-oriented than goal-oriented. Because goals come to an end, growth is continual. And you'll get to a goal and you'll be like, okay, now you got to create another. If I just keep on growing, I'm conquering goals and don't even know it. Like, as I grow, it's like, oh, my gosh, look what's taking place. I accomplished that. I accomplished that. Because out of your identity produces and it shapes action. I'm not saying don't have any goals, but don't let that trump growth and identity. This year, let us make sure that we be the type of people that is seeking identity and not seeking the do. Focus on the who. All right? Today is the last service of the year, so what I want to do is I want you guys to, uh, to get ready because wanna, we want to take the Lord's Supper. We want to take the Lord's Supper. I don't know. They may have had a cup right there, and I don't know if they even gave me one. It would have been, been good for me to get one, right? Thank you so much. And so what happened is the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night that Jesus was betrayed, what he done was he was in the upper room. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks about it. And so it's very important for us all to know that he, it, the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And if you, if you can hold on right fast, we're going we're gonna to go through it. And, and so in verse 23, it says, For I pass on you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God. If you can hold up. (laughs) Amen. He took some bread and he gave thanks for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given to you. So he's prophesying. He's telling them that. I'm going to give my body up for everybody. And that's what the bread represents. The bread represents God's body. And our sins was was born in his body. It was was right there in his body because he took on the sins of the world. So he says, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. It's very important for us to know that. And so as you, as you grab the bread which is a representation of his body, we do this in remembrance of the Lord Jesus, the bread. This is body. There's nothing wrong with taking the Lord's Supper. It's representation of his body. 
God's body hanging on the cross for all of our sins. So if you can take the bread, if you got, if you got the bread, you can lift it up in there if you, if you got it. It's okay to take the Lord's Supper. We're going to do this because we're doing this in the remembrance of Jesus Christ's death on Calvary. And if you can take the bread and the cup represents his blood that was shed for us. His blood was shed for our sins. The cross was for our sin nature. The blood was to wash away our sins. The cross was for us to see that we can die to our sin nature. But today, the blood represents the, him washing away our sins, and it's a new covenant that we can, be at, we can be forgiven of all our sins. We do this in remembrance of him. You can raise up your cup. We do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed for us. And we can take the cup. Today, Father God, we remember what you did on Calvary for us. We remember that you died to remember us, to put us back together, to remember us, to put us back together, our broken lives, our broken minds. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for dying on the cross and bore born our sins in your body. We thank you for your body. We thank you for allowing the whip to rip flesh off your body on behalf of us. We thank you that you allowed nails to be pierced to your body on behalf of us. So we could learn who we supposed to be. You shed your blood so you could wash away our sins, so you could teach us who we are as new individuals. Who? And out of us knowing who we are, what takes birth is a doing. We'll know what to do. Help us to learn how to seek you for identity this year. Help us to put you first and begin to fulfill the purpose out of a true and new identity in you, oh God. We thank you for your blood, Jesus. We do this in remembrance of you. Until you come back, Jesus. We purpose in our heart to continuously remember you. Remember that you are greater than our problems. You are greater than our pain. You are greater than our perspective. You are great. Because you're a problem solver. Because you're a healer because you're a mind renewer. And so today we lift up our hands, we lift up our voices, we declare that we remember you and everything that you've done for us. We remember your body on the cross. We remember you shedding your blood for our sins. We remember you. We remember you, oh God. And we thank you and we love you for everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus.